Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Horticulture School webinar series. If you have any questions today during the presentation, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lori. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Tom Gonzales. I'm a Manitoba Agriculture's Vegetable Crop Specialist, and I'd like to welcome you to the fifth webinar of this year's Horticulture School webinar series. Over the uh, past number of years, we at Manitoba Agriculture have presented extension information via in-person uh, event, uh, the annual Horticulture School. However, we all know with uh, COVID-19, there's been uh, certainly restrictions on uh, getting together. So Manitoba Agriculture and our partners at uh, Cinnaboyne Community College and Agriculture Agri-Food Canada are uh, able to uh, provide extension this year in the webinar format. Uh, and today's is the fifth webinar of a six webinar series. And our speakers are John Hurd, who is Manitoba Agriculture's Crop Nutrition Specialist, and Marla Rickman, who's Manitoba Agriculture's Land Use Specialist. And their presentation today deals with nutrient removal and soil sampling. Well, let's get right into it. Uh, take it away, John and Marla. Okay. okay. Am I showing the right screen, Lori? Well, right now I'm seeing, let's get started. Okay. So at the well, very top, John, go to display settings. Yeah. Click that and swap. Flop. There you go. Up. Perfect. There you go. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the uh, very flattering introduction here. And we'll try to meet your expectations. Uh, first thing I, I see I, I mis, miswrote was, uh, nutrient uptake and removal is actually what I'm going to introduce the topic with, and then we'll move on to soil sampling uh, for horticultural operations. And I'm glad to have uh, uh, Marla Rickman, uh, my co-host here today, to uh, fill in the blanks when I misspeak. Uh, yeah, I'm here for emotional support, John. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, good. So, We'll, we'll, we'll start right into it, and uh, hopefully the first part, when we talk about the nutrient uptake and removal, will impress upon you the importance of uh, nutrients uh, and the quantity required for some of the horticultural crops that we grow in Manitoba. And so the first one I'm starting with is looking at some of the uh, pulse crops that uh, may be grown as uh, uh, vegetables. And these are estimates that uh, I've brought in from uh, Ontario Agriculture. They are from some of their uh, commercial operations there. Uh, and so uh, they're listed in pounds per ton. And I, I, I talked to Tom yesterday and I really wasn't sure what tonnage or as far as tons per acre that we might be producing in Manitoba for these. But uh, nevertheless, let's look at the relative numbers here and uh, see what we can learn from them. Uh, when we look at green beans and green peas, the first thing is those are pulse crops. So much of the nitrogen that those crops are using, they're producing themselves if they're uh, properly uh, nodulating. Uh, beans, probably less so. We find that beans are sporadic nodulars, nodulators but uh, green peas are quite good at uh, making their own nitrogen. Uh, if we look at the uptake, those are the values that would be in the entire above ground material. Uh, and of course, only a portion of that is removed from the field. Uh, the removal, that would be the part that is uh, harvested and saleable. And we can see in with both those pulse crops, most nitrogen is left in the field in the vegetation form much of the phosphorus is left in the field and much of the potassium is left. So although we're growing these crops and they may be heavy feeders on some of these nutrients, a good portion of them is left in the field when 
they are uh, processed or, or harvested with some of the mechanical processors. If we look at some root crops, and here, when we look at uptake, it will include above ground, but also the harvested uh, uh, in soil portion. And so here we're looking at carrots, onions, and potatoes. And uh, look at these amounts. We see that about half the nitrogen and potassium that are taken up by that crop in order to grow and produce are left in the field uh, with the uh, vegetation there after harvest. A good portion of the phosphorus is uh, removed, particularly with carrots and onions. And uh, so that's a, a nutrient that uh, a good portion of what we put on is actually going to be uh, harvested uh, through, through those operations. If you're looking at coal crops here, I've uh, listed some values for broccoli and cabbage. And uh, interesting because with broccoli, we're harvesting the, just the, uh, the, the head there and leaving almost all the leaves in the field. So we're leaving a lot of the nutrients. We leave a lot of the nitrogen. We leave a lot of the potassium are staying in the field with all that green leaf material. With cabbages, where we're harvesting more of the leafy portion of the crop, uh, we're actually uh, removing a, a bigger portion of that nitrogen and potassium. One thing that I did not have, but we know is very important for coal crops because canola is a member of that crucifer family also. And we know sulfur is very important. And we see here that sulfur, of course, is something that will be uh, applied. Uh, I was able to find Ontario values for cabbage, but not for broccoli. Uh, and with these crops, since we're harvesting the leafy portion, we see also that a lot of the phosphorus is being removed from the field. And following up here with sweet corn and tomatoes, uh, again, some uh, crops that uh, are uh, see summarized here, about half the nitrogen and potassium are left in the field in the vegetation. A portion of the phosphorus is removed, but a, a good portion also remains. And if you look up at the picture of the sweet corn here, for example, most of our crops, field crops, when they're growing for uh, seed, such as you know canola, wheat, or grain corn, a good portion of those nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, about two thirds are commonly moved to the grain portion and removed. And so we're used to those uh, residues being, you know, having low to modest levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. Most of potassium stays in the stock. But with vegetable crops, because we're harvesting them at a less mature stage, we can have some fairly high values of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium remaining in the field. And the next slide here, it says, well, what's the role for cover crops when we when we're we're having to fertilize these vegetable crops fairly well to get good production, and yet we're leaving a lot of nutrients in the field. Marla, is there a role for cover crops in the vegetable rotation here? Oh, absolutely, John, especially if you're dealing with crops that have kind of low residue cover, vegetative cover um, at the end of the season and potentially crops that are harvested earlier in the season as well. So we've looked at situations where people are growing, say, um, carrots or other kind of root vegetables and other crops. We see this a lot in potato production um, where we use cover crops like rye following harvest because that soil sometimes is left quite exposed in the fall. And when we don't always have like heavy winds in the fall, we see these heavy winds in the spring and we can see high risk of things like wind erosion, especially on lighter soils that potatoes are grown on or soils that have had a lot of kind of extensive tillage to prepare the soil. So there can be benefits to growing a cover crop if you can get on and seed it in time to let that cover crop like a rye crop uh, establish and kind of create a bit of a buffer so that the soil doesn't blow the same in the spring. So it really can protect from things like erosion. Mm -hmm. 
Now I know Marla, you and I have been out, uh, we visited with some vegetable growers and I remember them saying that, well, but looking after all that broccoli or other things, look, the ground mm -hmm. is just covered with green leaf material. And yeah, how yeah. And around? yeah there was a kind of an attitude that, um, I think it was specifically we're looking at um, cabbages. And so there was a lot of kind of leaf material left behind, but the reality is a lot of that leaf material, A, isn't rooted into the soil. So it's just kind of on top. And again, we see when we do have some of those winds that can blow some of that residue around in the fall or in the spring. Um, but a lot of the residue of things like, you know, cabbages and such, two things that we observe. One is that a lot of them are filled with water. There's not a lot of kind of fiber in there. Uh, they, they kind of melt away quite easily. And the other thing that we saw was some of them like the stalks and such, they don't really do a whole lot. They take a while to break down, but they don't really do a whole lot if they're not left anchored in the ground. And so uh, again, there can be a lot of benefit to being able to place something that is actually anchored in the ground that goes into the winter green like a rye. Um, but then of course the issue with that is you need to spray it out or till it under in the spring before you end up planting. There are also cover crop options that don't overwinter. So you could be putting down oats or wheat or barley and growing that also to be able to kind of create that bit of a stand, which would be protecting the soil even into the spring, even though it's not growing green, as long as it has enough time to actually grow and create a bit of residue um, to protect the soil. Mm -hmm. and, and Marla, we probably should have inserted that uh, classic video of you this spring where we had you in the field in a, a crop where there was uh this was following potatoes but where there mm -hmm. was rye cover versus the adjacent field where the soil was on the move and uh, it, it was quite amazing to see the difference because the neighboring field was blowing like crazy had a lot of uh, sand blasting that was on it was planted both of them were planted into corn and so the corn had a lot of sand blasting and damage from that heavy wind um, and yet the field that had rye seeded to it had no wind damage and really no soil blowing at all. Mm -hmm. Good. So, so that, that, that uh, uh, covers some of the basics, some of the things that could be done right now for some of these crops is, is putting a cover crop down. The, the other job, of course, is, is soil sampling. So I'll move into that and um, again, ask, ask Marla to interject where she uh, is feeling pushy. So the outline is, you know, why soil sample? Uh, I want to go through some procedures, some do's and don'ts, some things about shipping samples and some of the soil test labs that are in Manitoba. And then actually we'll touch on, you know, some of the lab analysis and where you can get your fertilizer recommendations if you're looking for them. So firstly, why soil sample? Most people go right to number three. And I often say this is where people go and they say, okay, how much is this gonna cost me? Well, before we even get that far, we should be looking at number one and assessing, is this a suitable soil for growing the particular crop or whatever that I'm interested in, particularly for some uh, uh, horticultural operations, particularly in urban areas, there are some environmental concerns. And then number four is one where uh, there's an increasing number of people that are interested in knowing, uh, can I assess the health of my soil? And if so, is a soil test the best way to do that? So we'll, we'll look at some of those. So first, when I look at soil suitability, our soil test report has some pretty good important values on there that we need to pay attention to. The first one is often salinity, since Many, you know, vegetables are sensitive to soil salts. And, you know, if you're going to invest uh, the high costs in a, in a vegetable operation, uh, a soil test, if it's indicating to you that salts are, are an issue, they'll be an issue for a long time. And sometimes it may just be better to find a, a better spot rather than the investment in trying to fix a salinity area, which may come with number two, you know, improved drainage, may even require tile drainage and irrigation. So it could be quite expensive 
versus just finding a better spot at the start. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned thing. that, John. Sorry, now I'm interjecting. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that about finding a better spot. A lot of times people talk about whether or not they can kind of get that land into better production by lowering the salts. And you can do some. Um, with that improved drainage in the tile, I'm also happy to hear that you should tile drainage and irrigation together. Because one of the things you have to remember if you are trying to lower salts is that to get the salts down through that soil profile, you have to leach them out and then they would leach through and out of that tile line. Um, but if you're relying on mother nature only for the rainfall in order to leach that out, sometimes it can be quite varied in terms of the amount of time that it takes to leach that, that salt out of that soil profile. So adding irrigation gives you a bit more control on top. Um, but there are still limitations and I won't get into them too um, broadly, but if anybody wants to talk to me, reach out by email or phone um, because they're interested in tile drainage, we can talk a bit more about whether or not you actually can affect your salinity to a great enough uh, way in order to be able to grow some of those more salt sensitive crops. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. And no, number two, interesting enough, that this is what uh, Marla, our focus last year at the Hort Diagnostic School was was focused on this, you know, growing strawberries. And in Manitoba, because we're we're essentially we're blessed with high soil pH, and that comes with free lime because many of our soils are are uh, glacial based after running across the interlake and grinding up dolomitic limestone. When we have that in our soil, uh, it means that quite often we experience chlorosis in crops, an iron chlorosis. We see this a lot in soybeans, but it's very prevalent in strawberries. If you know that you have a site with high CCE or calcium carbonate equivalent values, it, I am suggesting here it's a lifetime of foliar iron for your soy strawberry crop. So know what you're getting into with the soil test. And it's rather rare in Manitoba, but we do have pockets of acid soils. And if we do have cases like that, it's a rather easy fix, particularly for smaller operations where simply liming can bring that pH up into a, a more suitable range for a, a crop production. So to look at for horticulture production, here is a soil analysis that I believe uh, was turned in to me from a, a fertilizer dealer who had done this for a horticultural operation. And like I say, one of the things that we look at is that, well, we can look at the fertility part of that soil test, and it shows me that there's very high fertility levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, other nutrients. The organic matter is over 7%, so it's high. So maybe this has been manured or heavily composted in order to bring those levels up. But what's really lurking that I see as the production limitations are below here. We see the salinity values here right into the uh, high range or very high range. And that would really impede uh, the options as far as uh, uh, crops that you could grow. The high calcium carbonate equivalent, of course, uh, would suggest that yes, iron chlorosis is probably going to be an issue if you're growing strawberries. Cation exchange capacity is usually our friend because that helps to hold nutrients in the soil. But when we have a very high value, in this case over 58 milli equivalents, that's suggesting that this is a fairly heavy clay soil. And when I see a heavy clay soil, that means, you know, I better look after my drainage, have some good surface drainage or something in here so that I don't end up in waterlogged conditions. So we ask, you know, when you look at the soil test report, look at the red stuff first, or what I think of as the productivity limits. And then because it's far easier to deal with the soil fertility values after. We can't necessarily go and buy things at the garden center or the co-op to fix salinity, high pH, 
or uh, poor drainage. And Marla, I, I know that we often, uh, for salinity, we uh, uh, use some of the information from uh, uh, North Dakota and others. This is actually uh, from the commercial vegetable production on the prairies guide. And it lists some of the sensitivity of uh, vegetable crops. Marla, do you want to explain to me why I've put in the two salinity values? This one yeah. is the one that was in the guide, but this is the one that people see on the soil test. Mm -hmm. why, why are those different? So there's two different ways that a salinity test is done in the lab. Um, the, the way that's listed on this chart, um, where it says zero to four, moderately sensitive four to eight, and then eight to 15, that way is referred to as the saturated paste test. And it is done where you take uh, kind of a known amount of soil and you add just enough water to make a slurry or what they refer to as like a plaster of Paris consistency. That slurry is then put onto filter paper and with suction, they draw the water off of that slurry. And then they analyze that soil water for uh, electrical conductivity or an assessment of how much salt, uh, salt concentration there would be. The thing with that test is it takes a lot longer to carry out because of course you have to put it on suction. It takes a lot of lab space, table space, having to do all of this. And so that saturated paste test actually costs uh, you as a grower, if you were sending off a soil sample, you would be spending an extra at least $20 per sample in order to have that specialized uh, analysis done. Now that analysis is done for research purposes. It's done for soil survey purposes. And the reason for it is having that kind of highly concentrated water gives an idea of what the root is experiencing in the soil. And so that is like a technical research type uh, analysis. What happens when you send a sample off to the lab is that you're paying less money for it, but that's perfectly fine. They also get a lot of samples. They're trying to move them through faster. So they take say 15 uh, grams of soil and then 15 milliliters of water. So they're equal parts by weight of water and soil. They mix that up and then they stick the probe straight into that mixture and then take a reading. Because there's more water that is a little bit more diluted. And because of that, the sample is lower or the number will be lower. And that's good because it's cheap, it's easy. It's what you want to use is something that's cheap and easy as a test. But if you are actually looking at your soil test and then comparing it against a chart like this that's talking about sensitivity and your soil test, let's say, let's say says four, you would look at that and say, oh, look, I'm right on the cusp of, of you know, sensitive to moderately sensitive. But that's if you were doing the special expensive test. Your number four is actually more equivalent to an eight. So you have to take your number and multiply it by two in order to compare it to the research number. Now your test is actually telling you that you're on the middle in the middle of moderately sensitive to moderately tolerant. So this is um, this is what you would have to do. You have to do a calculation, take your test, multiply it by two, and then you can compare it to one of these uh, these types of charts. It always drives me crazy that these charts are listed using the kind of research way of taking salinity, which means that you as a grower or as an agronomist have to actually make that calculation in your mind in order to do the comparisons. It's just a sad reality. So we're always having to explain that every time we talk about salinity. Mm -hmm. Good, th th thank you. But you do a better job explaining that than I do, Marla. So, uh, but it does show that even within vegetables, uh, we have a range of tolerances, but if you did happen to have a garden and you found that, geez, I grow great asparagus, beets, and spinach, but I can't grow carrots or beans worth a darn, it may be that it's time to check out salinity. And uh, Tom, I don't know if you're on the line, but I know that you ran into a bit of an issue in your uh, high tunnel that uh, you had salinity build up over time because the groundwater built up and carried salts with it yes john that's uh that's correct we're we're not at a danger point yet but we have been monitoring that 
annually and we are considering probably in not for next year but maybe the year after of actually uh rolling our high tunnel uh 50 feet to the east to uh, get on some uh fresh soil that uh, uh doesn't have the the same issues where our water source is uh for the high tunnel is from the city of portage and uh that is contributing to our salinity somewhat so yes uh, it is uh something that uh everyone has to consider and i especially like uh, marla's mention of uh that problem with the two tests because i get that question all the time what what's the deal with the numbers so yeah that's good good okay thanks okay the ne next part i wanted to just go over and, and and this hopefully is not an issue with uh listeners on the line but it's been in the winnipeg free press over the last couple of years so i thought i'd just mention it here and that is that an increasingly number of people are growing gardens in urban settings and for a very good explanation on that uh this uh uh, EPA has a, a, a very well-written article on this and what you may want to be watching out for. The issue is that, uh, uh, well, it's above there, you can see everyone growing uh, uh, their gardens with all that treated lumber and the little sandboxes there. And uh, uh, the next picture shows uh, plants. Leafy vegetables tend to accumulate uh, some of the hazardous products that that uh, might or contaminants that might be there. So enclosed in this fact sheet, there's a bit of a chart, and maybe I just mention because it's one of the ones we hear about. If if there is contaminated paint in the area, such as old residential buildings or whatever, or particularly fences between neighbors, that could be a contaminant of lead in in that area. Now, again, this is paint before, I think, 1978. Uh, there are other ones. Treated lumber, commonly used to build uh, uh, raised beds or whatever, could have arsenic, chromium, copper uh, in, in there. And uh, there are, are other uh, aspects. Coal ash, although it's not listed here, can have toxic levels of boron that uh, affect the plant. They don't affect people, but it affects plant growth. But again, as we go through here, there's a number. Sewage sludge uh, may be quite suitable for uh, field scale or, or field crop agriculture. But when we're harvesting uh, vegetable crops or, or leafy greens and things like that, we may find that they've uh, accumulated uh, some of the, the heavy metals or things. So this publication, you know, has uh, a number of these uh, uh, basically warnings out there. And within our, our own government, uh, we have some fact sheets that have been put together on, you know, uh, possible arsenic or cadmium as potential contaminants and where we might expect to see that in Manitoba. For testing, uh, uh, I believe ALS Laboratory in Winnipeg, they used to do routine soil testing for uh, gardens and farmers. They don't do routine soil testing for fertility anymore, but they can do this heavy metal scanning to see if some of these might be there. And when it's an environmental test, it's always more expensive, about three to six times more expensive than what your standard soil test would be. Uh, I put up here, I just Googled out of the Winnipeg Free Press that uh, the issue that they've been having with potentially contaminated soils in St. Boniface area, farmers be, or gardeners being warned. And then here's a press conference. And this fellow, we would consider the authority, uh, Dr. Francis Zvumoya. He is the head of the Soil Science Department, University of Manitoba. And I think. Uh, uh, he uh, dealt with uh, uh, the city when they were doing the samplings. He directed them so they do appropriate sampling and was very important in, in interpreting some of the results. 
So this is something that we deal with right, right in our backyard. Uh, I guess the thing that we would say, if you're a commercial horticultural operation, just be careful where you source some of your materials or byproducts. Uh, Tom, you and I were out visiting uh, a market gardener a, a couple years ago, and he indicated to us, he said, yes, uh, it wasn't until he analyzed his compost source that he found out, hmm, there's things in this compost that I shouldn't be using, uh, putting in my operation. And so he was the real advocate for testing what you're going to bring onto your farm, you know, even manures or particularly composts to make sure that you're not uh, introducing a source of contamination. Yes, John, uh, I, I remember that uh, specific incident. The, uh, from my perspective, the big takeaway on that was the person selling that to him was claiming, uh, oh, there's no issues, no issues. And he asked for, uh, for test results and uh, got some very generic test results that didn't go into the, the, the level that was required to find the possible, all the possible contaminants. And he did his own testing because he had purchased a number of loads of this already. And uh, I guess it's a, I don't want to be willy nilly, the sky is falling, but buyer beware sort of thing. So it's mm -hmm. definitely uh, an issue to, uh, for all growers to, to be aware of, John. Yeah, good. Okay, well, that's, that's all the bad news I have for you. Let's, let's go into soil sampling pointers. So uh, generally when we're sampling for nutrients, uh, what's pretty standard for us in Manitoba is a two depth of sampling. Although for horticultural operations, people may stick to shallow sampling. Uh, the shallow sampling zero to six inches generally is to get a good handle on immobile nutrients. Those are the ones that uh, kind of stay where they're put. They don't move in the water but we have a number of mobile nutrients, such as nitrogen, sulfur, uh, that we often like to have a handle on also. And for those, it would be smart for us to sample the full two feet. You can use a, a push probe, such as uh, uh, my son, the engineer here, uh, uh, using a probe that can go in that depth, or what we often use also might be a Dutch auger. We like to do about 12 to 15 pokes per field, and that is that many pokes, whether it's five acres or a quarter section. Uh, that's a, kind of a statistically derived number of samples that is good to have in order to get a, a, a good average number to represent the field. We say to take your samples in a random pattern, but we really don't mean random. We mean that you purposely avoid certain areas. You, you avoid headlands or, or high traffic areas where you may be pulling into the field where that load of manure was dumped or where fertilizer is more likely to be spread if there are manured spots, or, or even if there's a low area in that field, you may not want to sample it or sample it separately. You want a, a good, a good uh, handle on uh, to represent the, the majority of that field. And then we, we suggest whether you're sampling in the fall or the spring, it, it's best to do it when soils are cool. Uh, uh, if we sample warm soils, then the nitrogen component uh, is still on the move. Uh, nitrogen, uh, as long as soils are warm, we tend to get increasing values. And it basically is an indication of What's happening to organic matter? If organic matter is mineralizing or decomposing, then often we get a nitrogen uh, release. And the soil test really isn't meant to take that into account. The soil test wants uh, a stable level. And so we'd suggest either later fall or early spring sampling. Now, if you're looking for soil sample probes, uh, uh, you, you know, you go right to the source. There's a uh, a company, Elijah Camp, uh, but they're based in North Carolina. Uh, that's often 
uh, the company that we get our Dutch augers through. If you're looking for tube samplers, Agvise Labs, they're located in North Dakota, but they do uh, uh, supply uh, push probes that we quite often use in our extension work. And they could be purchased and you would uh, simply uh, go online and uh, choose uh, you know, what, what, what you'd prefer to use uh, there and make those arrangements. So you can still, still obtain hand sampling supplies. The thing that we suggest that if you're gonna be sampling, as we suggest the zero to six and six to 24 inch sample, you're gonna have two uh, bags to submit to the lab. Uh, again, handling, we like to keep it cool. Uh, rubber gloves are helpful, but the main thing we're doing there is we're avoiding contaminants. If you're a smoker or if you're eating sunflower seeds, anything like that, we can contaminate the samples with uh, uh, nutrients or ash that will taint our results. We should be using plastic pails, uh, not metal pails, because they may have things such as zinc plating in them that would uh, contaminate our results. Th there are also commercial custom sampling. Uh, many of the fertilizer dealers out there will do some of the sampling. There's a number of crop consultants, and they will have a soil a hydraulic probe right inside their truck that they can drive around. And it may well be that uh, uh, there's a local co-op or something in your area that uh, could do that sampling for you also. The, these are the, the most local labs, the laboratories, the ones that are probably uh, most active for Manitoba area. Uh, the Farmer's Edge Laboratory is located in Winnipeg. And uh, they've got a, a range of prices. I've listed the prices here uh, going from the basic up to a complete. The basic would tell you what you need to know for your major fertilizer nutrients. The complete analysis would go into uh, micronutrients uh, and, uh, and other factors. So uh, the Farmer's Edge Laboratory has a range of prices depending on how detailed a test you wish. Agvise, are, they're located in Northwood, North Dakota. Uh, you can uh, send samples there. They actually have, uh, I believe, a pickup area in Portage La Prairie and in Winkler, Manitoba, uh, where they can pick up Manitoba samples. And they, they, their cost range is, is similar to the Farmer's Edge. ANL Labs uh, operates out of London, Ontario, but uh, samples are moved down there fairly quickly, I believe, by air. Uh, they have uh, a range of sampling costs also. And I'll make mention of it later, but that they also feature a soil health assessment. And the range, price range for that soil health assessment is you know, $75 to $150. ALS in Winnipeg. They, they don't do agricultural soils anymore, but they're the ones that would do a separate analysis to see if there are contaminants of concern. Um, I don't know, Tom, are there other labs that some of the horticultural operators are using that I, I should maybe have on my list here? Uh, no, I think you, uh, you, you covered the, the the main ones i'm not uh or not just the main ones i mean i'm not aware of any producers using other uh labs okay okay uh sometimes uh marlon and i like to carry out some gadgets and test kits i know most recently i think marley you have one that measures salinity and we're measuring ph also last year um, we were using, uh, last year, uh, yes, we were doing pH using just pH strips, uh, litmus paper, um, in order to analyze pH. Yeah. Uh, there are pH meters that you can use that are handheld in the field. Nothing ever compares really to what you can do in a lab, but sometimes there are some handheld pH meters that can give you a general, general range, um, but again, they won't be as accurate. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that that's one of our cautions for people. If you are picking up a test kit at a garden center or something like that, uh, you uh, are probably not receiving the same value. Uh, having these all these laboratories uh, have uh, standards that they cross-reference to, and so you're getting uh, some reliable numbers uh, versus using a, a, a test kit. To me, a test kit would maybe just alert you to you may have a problem, but it's probably not going to be specific enough to make a recommendation for you. So, which we go to next, and we look at, I've just clipped here and put up here, you know, a sample soil test report from ANL Laboratories, AgVise Laboratories, and Farmer's Edge. In red, they all have a, a session or section where they provide the analysis, what's what their instruments read, and then they have a section where they will post their recommendations. So uh, one of the things you put on the input form, you would say which, which vegetables or whatever you were looking to produce, and then they would uh, provide often some specific recommendations. I know, I think on this one, we actually use this on a tour. It was a carrot farm, and we actually put in a range of uh, yields that might be expected, and they made a, a recommendation based on the various yields. Oh, well, here's the example right here. So. Um, uh, this was actually a field in the in the portage area we sampled uh, on a soil science tour a couple of years ago, and here for a uh, 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 yield goal of 400 100 weights of carrots per acre, they're recommending uh, you know maybe a modest rate of nitrogen, uh, a fairly good rate of phosphorus, but most other nutrients it's saying we were tested and were found to be quite adequate in the soil. So uh, a, a fairly focused uh, fertilizer recommendation, just saying nitrogen and phosphorus is what you need. Now, you can look for second opinions. One, we have some Manitoba agriculture guidelines. Our soil test lab used to run uh, until 1992, and we still have those guidelines. They're, they're still on the same stone tablets that Moses came down from the mount on, and so we have those uh, tablets that we can refer to, or there's some new updated, there's the Prairie Guide, or we could go to some of the Minnesota or Ontario guidebooks, uh, uh, providing we have a soil test report, often we can glean recommendations from there. So let's look at from our, our Manitoba uh, recommendations here, we could go and, and crops are, are grouped together. Carrots, you can see, are grouped in with asparagus, beans, parsnips, vines, squash, and pumpkins, all expected to perform similarly to nitrogen. And based on the soil test value that we have at the top, it will give a range of recommendation for that. So that would be for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, same thing. With phosphorus, we really only have three categories. Uh, the one that carrots are in, uh, a category of more uh, root and coal co crops, and then potatoes. And again, that recommendation would vary based on the soil test value. Uh, and with potassium, again, they have uh, a crops that behave similarly listed together. And uh, we, we have this uh, information but we really haven't put it out in a recent publication uh, for you, uh, but it's it's available if you're interested. Uh, I found that, uh, that there was a commercial vegetable production on the prairies. This guide I found had the Alberta logo on it, and it has some general fertilizer recommendations, but generally not soil test based. Uh, uh, for that, we would chase you back to our soil test tables. I really like this publication from Minnesota. Uh, uh, it's available online, and I believe it has some very relevant recommendations for us, and they are soil test based. So if you had a soil test report from 
Farmer's Edge or AgVise or even uh, ANL Labs uh, out of London, you could take those values and using the charts in this guidebook, uh, you could derive a, a recommendation. Similarly, the Ontario Field Vegetable Guide has recommendations based on the soil test. So uh, that would be, be, be some good places to go to for second opinion. Now, I just wanted to show you the other thing about soil tests, uh, how uh, it's valuable for us to use. And this is a little project that Mario Tenuta at the University of Manitoba did a few years ago, basically to compare or contrast what's the soil nutrient status of gardens versus commercial vegetable fields in Manitoba. And we're looking at uh, the scale is either for nitrate, nitrogen, or phosphorus on here. And in the nitrogen levels in the surface, we find in Winnipeg Gardens or Elm Creek Gardens is quite high compared to, I think the next, okay, uh, uh, compared to commercial fields. I think this is one thing we're showing here. Commercial farmers, they handle fertilizer, I think, with more respect because it is, it's a crop input cost to them. Uh, for gardens, the cost is often uh, not considered and more is, more is more prevalently applied and maybe they aren't using proper equipment or soil testing to help direct their applications. So out of this, we see some uh, many fold higher numbers of nitrogen and particularly of phosphorus uh, in those Winnipeg or Elm Creek St. Claude Gardens than what we would expect to find in commercial fields. If we look at, well, what are the environmental limits? Well, uh, I have listed here some of the, uh, I guess we call it the speed bumps that uh, uh, we have under, uh, oh, sorry, uh, uh, under some of our uh, environmental guidelines in Manitoba as far as when different uh, um, criteria kick in as far as uh, it's okay to be at this level, but if your soils are less productive, so, sorry, I should say our most productive soils are allowed to have a nitrogen level of this 120 left after harvest. Uh, uh, less productive soils, the yellow, and our least productive soils are only permitted to have 60 pounds residual phosphorus. And here we can find that some of our urban gardens are exceeding that. And if we look at the regulatory limits for phosphorus, it's quite acceptable to be up to 60, but for people that are applying manure, their regulations start kicking in at 120 and 180. And so some of these gardens or urban gardens or lawns are exceeding some of these uh, standards that, that Manitoba farmers are being held to yet commercial vegetable gardens are operating well within the environmental limits. Something about the, uh, uh, the soil test here for soil health, uh, the, the lab I mentioned, ANL labs, uh, we have completed, done some soil health testing at Portage uh, a couple years ago for a tour that Marla and I were involved in and a soil test report came back and interestingly, this part of the soil test report is basically the standard chemical test that it would be done uh, to assess nutrient status. But the other stuff is below here where they start referring to some of the biological activity and organic carbon and organic nitrogen contact or, or uh, content. Uh, on this next slide, they talk about a biological quality result. And this is coming back and testing very high quality. The carbon dioxide carbon result or burst, it's almost off, right off scale for being highly active for producing lots of carbon dioxide. And it has a very high level of mineralizable nitrogen. 
So Marla, is this a really healthy soil or are you skeptical of the test? I'm going to say it depends, John. Is that the answer that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, and this actually comes up to, there was a question earlier that came into the chat box about uh, the Haney test. And so since we're talking about soil health tests, um, in this case, we'll, I'll touch on that too. Um, when it comes to soil health tests and some of the analysis that's carried out with these tests, it's important to think about the fact that a lot of times these tests have been created, developed, and kind of ground truthed or tested in the areas or regions that they were created in. They have not been created for Canadian soils or Manitoba-based soils. So sometimes we see something like this, like this CO2 burst. Um, quite often, I have not seen a lot of soils in Manitoba, even the ones that you would dub the unhealthiest by however you want to kind of uh, consider them healthy or unhealthy, um, that haven't had high CO2. We typically have high microbial activity in our soils, and a lot of that comes back to the fact that we also have very high organic matter in our soils naturally. So soils like this, when they're looking at this mineralizable nitrogen release, they're, ad for, they're basically making a, a best guess scenario based on the amount of organic matter in the soil and how active those microbes are. So we send our soil samples off uh, to a lab like this and they'll say, wow, you've got you know, 6% organic matter and your CO2 is off the charts. You're going to have this huge amount of release of mineralizable nitrogen. You don't need to apply any nitrogen at all for next year's crop. So you go and you test that and you don't put any nitrogen down and you have a crop failure. And the reason is while our soils might be very microbially active in the summer when we are testing them, they are not microbially active all year round. And so you can't assume that the kind of shorter summer season that we have with that activity is going to result in a really fast turnover of nitrogen or my, a mineralizable nitrogen happening. So we have to take this with a grain of salt and we need to understand that these tests have not been ground truthed in Manitoba or in the Canadian prairies. So that's one big thing. Um, the, the question that had come up on Haney, um, I, I've had some experience with Haney, but I've never had an experience where the Haney test actually told me anything that was very useful. And to that effect, a lot of labs are actually no longer offering the Haney test because they're finding that there just isn't good information coming out of it. Um, it relies heavily again on the CO2 burst. It may work very well where they've been de uh, developed at Texas A&M, or you know, in Maryland where they developed Silvita test, but again, not super relevant, unfortunately, here. So we go back to looking at our base information on a soil test, like you know, CEC and um, that kind of information to be able to understand things about our soils. Mineralizable nitrogen is a difficult one to really be able to estimate on our soils here. Mm -hmm. Uh, John, just, I see you flip the screen now to the final soil health test report. And so what often happens with these reports is they take all the information from them and they then come up with a, you know, a general scorecard. And so you've got all those colors that show up on that, re on that report. And basically what they're telling you is, you know, are you in the, in the red? Are you in the green, which is where you want to be? Or are you in the blue? Because sometimes being... This is where I'm always confused. So, you know, organic matter in the blue is great, but then sometimes you can be really high in something that might actually be a problem, like heavy metals or something like that. So the color scale hasn't quite, I haven't figured it out exactly, but as Kaylee Gash would say at NDSU, she's a microbiologist, soil microbiologist there. Um, she says, that's great. You got a test, you got the score done. That's fantastic. Take that piece of paper and file it away in the filing cabinet. You might refer back to it later on, um, but it doesn't necessarily give you a really strong indication of what you're doing well versus what you're not doing well uh, in terms of soil management. There's other simpler factors, like is your soil blowing away? Um, is your soil washing away? Uh, is your soil building aggregates? Um, are those aggregates stable? That kind of oh, thing. You're, you're, you're talking way too fast, Marla. Let, let me oh. the pictures to catch up to you. 
Okay, I didn't realize we were jumping that far into this. Okay, so so that's what I I, I my slides were showing that you know there is an institution which I think you've been following some of their uh, webinars, yep. the Soil Health Institute, and that so far I think their verdict is that you know some many of these microbial tests are not quite ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. We lack the standards in order to relate those numbers to things, like you and, say. Yeah, and the lack of standards, there's a couple of issues with these. One is that sometimes the standard is lacking such that you can, and we saw this with Solvita with the, um, the carbon re release test, that you could take the same mix of soil sample off and send it to three different labs and get three completely different results. So the standard in the lab isn't necessarily there. Also, sometimes with these tests, the time of year that the analysis is taken can greatly affect the result. So then do you take it in June or do you take it in July? And if you're coming back next year, and I did it in June last year, but I do it in June next year, well, is the conditions, the weather, the rainfall, the soil moisture, the temperature, all of that, is that the same next June to properly compare? So a lot of these biological measures, we just don't have enough information to truly be able to use these measures as you know a standard test yet we have a lot of work to go like to do in order to be able to utilize these that's why and i like counting what worms. Institute is doing yeah yeah i can count worms and it doesn't cost me anything marla i know and but john did you know how many worms you need to have yeah in 10 a per square foot? Foot. yeah do you know where that yeah. number comes from uh Yes, just right out of thin air, I'm sure. It is actually. So we always say 10 earthworms per uh, cubic foot of soil. And it is a number that is just randomly pulled out of the air by someone some at some point in time. So, you know, it's a standard, but it's not a standard that has any kind of reason behind it. Okay, now I'm going to show another slide, Marla. It's one that you and I feel more comfortable in. And it's some of the the physical measures are mm -hmm. much more uh, important when it comes to soil health. Yes, and and I, I want to say too, though, that these sometimes people think that when we talk about these physical measures, we're discounting the biology. And I want to say that in no way are we discounting soil biology by utilizing these physical measures, because these physical measures actually depend on soil biology to build good aggregation, good soil structure. The bugs are helping to do that. So they're a big part of creating the soil structure that you're looking for and testing with these physical measures. So John has water infiltration. So this is a very simple measurement where you take a ring, uh, you can take like a, P a thin PVC pipe or a metal ring, you want it to be at least six inches long and you pound that down into the ground and you add an inch of water. So based on the, the volume uh, or the, the area of that uh, ring, you can figure out how much water you need to add to create one inch. And then you basically time how long it takes for that one inch of rain to soak up into the soil. So it's a simple measurement that you can do just to look at water infiltration. And it's important because it tells you how well your soil will actually absorb rainfall versus just having that soil that can't absorb it and that rainfall that is so important to be able to feed a crop just runs off and pools somewhere or runs off into the ditch. And so it's not actually helping you if it isn't absorbing into the soil. And then uh, John has wet aggregate stability here. So these are things where you actually can look at how stable that aggregate is when it's in contact with water. So um, you basically are observing how much of that aggregate falls apart from having been uh, set in water. And I don't know if you have the Slakes app in your presentation, John, here. Um, uh, I didn't find that today, no. Yeah, and so if anybody wants to look it up, there is an app, it's kind of interesting, it's new. I haven't had a lot of time to test it yet, but the Soil Health Institute has tested it and they have felt that it works very well. And so it's called Slakes, S-L-A-K-E-S. -E and so you can look it up on your Android or your Apple device. And basically you end up using the camera of your phone um, and then uh, identifying some soil aggregates, 
uh, it shows you a video through the app to be able to show how to use it. And then you put those into a Petri dish with water and you let them kind of fall apart over 10 minutes and it'll analyze whether or not those soils were kind of held together well or how much they fell apart based on the surface area or the area that it kind of falls apart in as the camera is observing observing that um, kind of soil fluffing off around the aggregate. It's kind of a cool new tool out there. Mm -hmm. Good. So and 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 more more to come on that. Uh, uh, we see the soil health stuff is under development. So in summary, uh, we see soil test important to assess suitability for even establishing a garden or commercial operation there. You want to check off that environment of contaminants are under problems. There are options as far as getting fertilizer recommendations from various states or provinces once you have a soil test report. And it's important to track progress with your soil fertilizer uh, report. Year-to-year uh, -year progress will show whether your soils are being depleted, or on the other hand, if they're being built up to excessive levels, you want to nip that in the bud. Uh, extremely high soil fertility levels gray, grow great tops on potatoes, but not many spuds underneath. And then the other would be soil health. Well, stay tuned for that and expect more from Marla in the future. So, Chairman Tom, I'm going to turn this back over to you for any questions, if you have any. Uh, have it, yes, thank you, John. Hi, thank Martin. you, yeah. Have any questions come in, Lori, to you? Yes, actually, um, Marla and I both have been uh, trying to answer some of these questions as we go. However, there are some that uh, you can certainly help out with. Tom, um, uh, John, if you want to just leave your screen up there, we'll just leave that there while we go through some questions in case we have to go back to your screens. Sure. So, uh, Tom, can you um, give any suggestions about a reliability and cost or calibration requirements for some soil testing equipment? Cost of equipment. Now, what, what I'm familiar with on this uh for for this audience would be more to do with the the hand augers and soil augers that that are available i think john had mentioned a source in the u.s for hand augers um there is a a source uh it's in bc i believe prince george uh irl supplies i believe is the name You'd have to Google up IRL supplies to confirm that, but that would be a, a Canadian source that would eliminate the the border, uh, any issues at the border to do with shipping and uh, duties, et cetera. I'm certainly not pushing uh, that company necessarily, but I that's one I do know of. I believe the augers, a complete auger with the extension handle and bit are in the 250 to $300 range um i'm not sure if that was getting at what the question was or not though i think that I can, uh, yeah yeah Go i ahead. can add into that because i think i had uh kind of asked a question just to clarify what was being asked for too and this one sorry laurie um and uh i think the question also was looking uh for john on whether or not there's some like fast analytical tests like using pH meters, nitrate tests, or other kind of quick equipment that can be used in the field. So are there any pieces of equipment like that that can be used? And then there's a, uh, I'll let you ask her that one, and then there's a kind of a follow-up related question to that, John. Except you need to unmute yourself. Hello, John. We could maybe go back to that once John comes unmuted. Okay, so then there was another one down here. Um, I just want to find some that we hadn't get. Um, there was a 
For horticultural crops, including potatoes, are there any reliable hand scanners portable to tools or digital technology you would recommend for identifying nutrient deficiencies in field? In particular, easier to use units you can give to summer staff and remote field scouts and expert and expert reliable results back. So that's kind of the similar question again. Yeah, I think John's unmuted now though. <laughs> yes, I was talking to myself. Uh, <laughs> We, we uh, to the local high school here, the science club there evaluated some of these, like the Lamotte's soil test uh, kit that you can get at garden centers, and actually did okay. But of course, it provides you with no recommendation or guideline. And I would think it would be fraught with uh, not having a standard to go by. As far as sensors or things like that, uh, some of them tend to be expensive. The ones I like best are the nitrogen sensors based on your eye. And uh, there is just a, a range of green colors that you would have a scale in front of you, about uh, uh, six ranges of, of green. And you would have, uh, you just basically look at one plant that's well fertilized with a dark green color, and it would give you a chance to come visually compare others to it. And that's that's all that it is. It's just a visual comparison, and uh, it's used commercially for rice production in the Philippines, and actually worked fairly well for us when we would do it here with wheat and corn. But uh, uh, it's nothing that the human eye doesn't do itself. It is just comparing the color of something that's well fertilized versus something else that you're you're curious on. Okay, great. And there was one last question here. Uh, can you recommend a cover crop mix that could, sorry, that includes plants with a strong enough tap root to punch through heavier subsoils and improve water infiltration? Sock it to him, Marla. <laughs> I was going to say, before John says, just Marla, take this one away. Uh, okay, so in terms of cover crop mixes, there's a lot of different varieties of, of cover crops that are out there. Um, if you're dealing with something that has that taproot, you know, things like canola do really well for punching through heavy subsoils. Um, that being said, I don't want to say that they will punch through everything. Everyone always talks about how amazing alfalfa is and how deeply rooted alfalfa can be. And yet at the same time, I have seen an alfalfa field that rooted two feet and that is it. Um, because at the two foot depth, there was an extremely dense, naturally dense soil um, that it basically was like concrete. So, you know, roots are going to basically exploit the spaces that they can and work a way to, to break up deeper compaction. Um, but again, some of those tap rooted crops like canola do have the ability to push through to some degree. They can't push through everything. Now I say canola because I'm really referring to things that are in that brassica family with that tap root. Um, if you are looking at something like tillage radish, you know, they come with names like brand names or if you see uh, seed names like jackhammer and stuff like that. So they definitely indicate that they have some of that punching power, but I don't want people to get, I, I, have, I have some slight concerns when it comes to things like um, brassica or uh, tillage radish being heavily promoted as a cover crop. One is if you are in a crop rotation, now if you're a market gardener you might not have a lot of other like uh, you won't have canola in your rotation but you might be growing other brassicas like cabbages and broccolis and things like that. So using a brassica means that you have increased risk of those root rots, um, um, root maggots, uh, you know, we don't know, but we assume that it'll host things like canola, our club root for canola. So we really have to be careful that we're not overdoing it in the rotation by having too much of that in the rotation. But basically a lot of, my big thing about a cover crop mix is you really do want to think about having a bit of a mix of root types. So you want a bit of a grassy root with a fibrous system. You want a bit of a tap root. It doesn't have to be just a, a brassica type. 
Um, but there are a lot of mixes out there. Just be cautious in terms of what you're growing in your rotation, where we may actually see issues with insects and diseases carry over because we're increasing that pressure by not kind of breaking up our crop rotation as much. Anything else to add there, John? No, I don't have anything. Okay, it looks like that is it for our questions today. Um, if anyone gets a question in last minute that we miss, I will ensure that that gets off to Marla and John or Tom. So I guess with that, thank you. And I will send it back to Tom to wrap things up. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lori. And uh, thank you very much to Marla and John. I, uh, I just before I wrap things up, I'd, I'd like to concur with Marla's uh, mentioning of the uh, caution about uh, using uh, tillage radish. Um, I'm not saying don't use it, but uh, just be cautious about uh, about using it. So th thanks again to our presenters, bo both uh, Marla and John and to uh, all of you who have uh, joined us uh, for today's webinar. There's one more webinar remaining in the uh, Hort School uh, series, and it will be held on Thursday, October 8th at 1.30 p.m. If you've already registered, which you have because you're listening, uh, you don't need to register again. You just need to uh, be online to uh, get it on uh, October 8th at 1.30. Uh, I, I wanna mention here, those of you that uh, are uh, certified crop advisors and would like to receive CCA credits, you can uh, email your CCA number to Tracy Cummer. Uh, her email address is on the screen, T-R-A-C-E-Y dot C-U-M-M-E-R at symbol G-O-V dot mb dot ca and she will work with you to uh get get you credit for today's uh attending today's webinar so with that uh, again i'd like to thank everybody for tuning in our presenters and laurie for doing her magic behind the scenes and you have yourself a great afternoon thanks everybody <laughs>